A very good afternoon and welcome back to the Touchline on Y254. Max Olwasike is my name. But this time round, we want to discuss about international football headlines on the segment, the fan zone, the fan favorite segment. And uh, we start with, you know, what happened last weekend, you know. Harry Kane was looking forward to winning his first major silverware with Bayern, but unfortunately, Leipzig had to beat them and spoiled his part. Yeah, I think uh, people thought the hype uh, of Hurricane playing in that game would help them win the, uh, win the game, but it was not to be. Uh, but I still think that in the long run, in the end, he'll finally yeah. get his mm. trophy with Tottenham. Mm. That was just a one-off game. It was more of a precision issue, a cut and razor. I think Hurricane adds more quality to a squad that already has quality, and at the end of the season, they'll do what they always yeah. do. But of keen interest is to, is to watch how the band defense is. Is arranged because under Tuchel, I think they have been really, really weak in that department. They have given away a lot of goals, and also their midfield has sort of not got what Tuchel actually wants to play. Uh, their, their front line, their attacking line is full with is filled with talent, but watch out for the Bayern Munich defense. I think they will be really, really under the test. Even though they added Kim Minja to the ranks, I think seeing how they defend will be something really crucial for them this season. Last night, Harry Kane scored. Is this the start of you know big things ahead of him after his move from Spurs to Bavarians? Well, one thing you're always guaranteed of if you move to Bayern Munich is winning the league at least. So I think they'll win the league again. So Hurricane will get his silverware. But I think it's the Champions League they want the most. I mean, they're Bavarians. They believe they're the best in the world, and Champions League is their forte. So Hurricane Hurricane has been brought to win the Champions League and not necessarily win the Bundesliga or DFL Pokal and uh, yeah they need to just sort out their defenses the attack is very good they're spoiled for choice sort out your defense primarily uh, a little bit of midfield but not so much but sort out your defense your attack is already good the trophies will come there has been a lot of castigation around this personal achievement and scorecard because you know people say that whenever you retire you got to have something <laughs> to show oh, for what uh, you achieved in your own personal cabinet. So people are saying that Harry Kane, for him, it's mm. top scorer's record, but no big trophy under his name. Now that you're talking about you know, his ambition to win mm. a Champions League title, because mm. I think for a Bundesliga title, I think that's given, right? Yeah, that, that's given. Because Bayern has won it I for the last 10 years? Bill. Consecutively, exactly. since uh, 2013, they have won the Bundesliga consecutively. Close to a decade. Yeah. So I, I think uh, the thing here is always you get these big players, especially the teams in Europe that are not Spanish or are in the Premier League. They get the big players to try and win the Champions League. We saw it with PSG. They brought in Messi, Neymar, Mbappe to just win the, PS the Champions League because the domestic league is not that strong. Some of these teams are are on even less than a quarter of the revenue that these teams have. So buying players, the players available for them will always be different. They just want to win the Champions League and crown it off. But you never take the, the domestic league for granted because it's your home league. It's what gives you an identity towards and what enables you to qualify for the Champions League. So as much as they are aiming the Champions League, I think a club like Bayern having Hurricane their target, their target right now, even the coach Thomas Tuchel has come in, the signings they've made, their target should be a treble at the very least because it's easy for them to win the domestic titles. Now the only challenge is how do we beat Real Madrid, Manchester City, all these guys, even this season they'll have Arsenal. How do we beat them to win the Champions League? Yeah. And talking about, you know, European glory, Manchester City added another major silver after beating Sevilla mm. in UEFA European Cup. Super Cup. Is this the team to get scared of as far as world club football stage is concerned? Yeah, they're still favourites in the Champions League, but Real Madrid are and always... Premier League as well. And the Premier League. Of course, they'll be in the top for that one, I'm sure about. Uh, but in the Champions League, they're still favourites. I'm still looking for that strong team that can mount a challenge. Maybe Real Madrid. Mm. Arsenal haven't convinced me yet as far as Champions League go by. But uh, Manchester City is, is still the team to beat, mm. in my opinion. Yeah, uh, for me, I think uh, 
Real Madrid is the team to beat owing to what they've done over the summer transfer window. And also a key thing to note is uh, Man City for a majority of the season they'll be without Kevin De Bruyne. And also, you know, they've lost some of really important players for them, especially towards the end of the season. If you look back at the last three or four seasons, Ilkay Gundogan, over since February, has almost been the top scorer at that time for Manchester City. On penalties, he was so good, runs into the box, they have lost him. And the person they have signed is Matteo Kovacic, who I don't think is, gives the same as Gundogan does. And they've also lost Riyad Mahrez. And I've seen uh, Peppers try to give Cole Palmer a starring role, but I don't think he's of the same quality as Mahrez or, or uh, even Ford. And so I think it's really, really tough for them to go into games without Kevin De Bruyne, who gives them all the assists. You know, he's more, he pulls the strings in the midfield, but you know, you can't rule them out because they still have great players. Uh, some of their players are uh, 100 million players, world class, so they can still be there. But something with Real Madrid is the, the Champions League is more of their competition. Yeah. With Bellingham coming in now, you know, next season probably Mbappe coming in, you know, the uh, coming three, four seasons, they might do what they did again in 2015, 16 and 17. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, someone was telling me last night that, you know, the problem Jurgen Klopp alongside Pep mm. Guardiola did was, you know, winning Premier League and Continental title and still remaining at their respective teams that they ought to have, you know, looked for another challenge elsewhere. Like for the case of Jurgen Klopp, because mm. Liverpool looks like they're dwindling. Yeah. And and you know the thing. And, and I, 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 I I hold contrary opinion. I was of the idea that probably someone like Diego Simeone of Atletico Madrid is yeah. the one that needs to look for challenge elsewhere because mm. he's had an overstay mm. at the team, but nothing proper forthcoming. Yeah, uh, I think the question that one will answer that with is where is the bigger challenge? You're already at Liverpool, one of the biggest clubs in the world. You've won the Premier League this season. Next season, you, it won't be easy for you to win it. You have City breathing down your ne neck, Chelsea, Arsenal, United, even now Newcastle. Madrid won it yeah. three times consecutively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can try Madrid. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the problem is Madrid, Madrid They are take, already sorted. Yeah, and they, they have a, a thing where they pick who they want. You do not pick Real Madrid. <laughs> they, they, if they do not want you, you, you ask yourself, at that time when they chose Carlo Ancelotti, he was from Everton. He was not the best manager in the world. Klopp and Guardiola were doing their thing, but Madrid still wanted Ancelotti. So I think for, for that challenge, the Real Madrid challenge is you have to be patient with it. But for Klopp and Pep, I think they can still stay at City and Liverpool because there are still big challenges. Winning the Premier League again consecutively, that is something amazing. Something only I think Alex Ferguson had done it before. Even Wenger hadn't done so. You know the challenge is still there. It's just that there, there are failures that you you'd expect to come after a really successful season, and that's something I, I I really see with Man City. With now the injury starting to hit, you'd have to be cautious of uh, you know putting anything on them this season. Morris, yeah, Real Madrid. When they want you, they call you. But even when they call Ancelotti, had won La Decima. Mm. So, but. Real Madrid is Real Madrid. Everybody, as a manager, wants to manage Real Madrid. And as a player, you want to play for Real Madrid. Of course, the Barcelona fanatics will have something to say about that. But Real is Real. Uh, every player dreams about donning that shirt. So, uh, yeah, I think your prediction are about right. Manchester City, Real Madrid this season in the Champions League. Yeah. It looks like it that way. They are the teams to beat yeah. in continental football. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move away to matters transfer and, uh, you know, before even we talk about the move by Neymar to Saudi Arabia, let's talk about Theo Alcott mm -hmm. retiring, announcing his football retirement at the age of 34, you know, former Arsenal, Southampton, Everton player, yeah. you know, has had an illustrious career. What do you remember him for? Uh, I, I remember him for coming to Kasarani. Now with Everton, when they are playing against Kerodongi Yeah, in 2019. And a lot of ladies showing up. Yeah, he, <laughs> had, he, he got the loudest draw when his name was called uh, from the player list. But I think at uh, Walcott, when he was still young playing for Arsenal, I think he was a really promising player. He was one of the fastest players we had ever seen in the Premier League at that time. He was a key player for Arsenal when their 
uh, qualifying for the Champions League year in, year out. Mm. But it was sort of sad to see him, you know, fall out a bit, uh, fall off from where he was. Because ever since he went to Everton, I don't think he's hit the heights he hit when he was a young player for Arsenal. Because at that time, he even started for England. Mm. He, he travelled with England to the World Cup, to the Euros. But uh, he went to Everton and now Southampton. They got relegated last season. But, you know, you cannot forget what he did for Arsenal mm. at that time where him and players like Jack Wilshere were still young kids. Mm. They are the ones who really pushed the Arsene Wenger style of tiki-taka football with Arsenal. So, you know, he will be missed in the footballing world. He's a really, really popular figure, especially, as you said, amongst the ladies. But also the Arsenal fanatics really, really loved Theo Walcott. Yeah. And uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> he didn't win <laughs> Premier League with Arsenal. Uh, all, all the players did not. <laughs> I've, I've always thought he's the brother to Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> They, they <laughs> quite resemble. Yeah, yeah, they quite resemble. But he's had an illustrious career. 34 years to call it quits, not bad. Mm. He has a few England and, and collapse, won a few medals with us and also it's not bad. He's not had a bad career. Some, some quarters in the social media are saying uh, of a hyped English you know, footballer as always. But I think uh, he was a decent player. World class, yes, but not at the level that maybe some quarters had put it to, but he's had a good career. Yeah. Yeah. Can we blame British media for, you know, hyping and glorifying these uh, English players? Because we've had Theo Alcott, we've had Jack Wilshere, you know, we've had a lot of players who have shown talent at a tender age, but, you know, a few years later they disappear and vanish. Mm -hmm. um, we blame structures, coaches, or no. Or uh, media glorification? I think uh, to, to some extent there has to be that glorification because we also see, I think there's some sort of padding when it comes to guys like Jack Grealish and mm. Phil Foden, you know. And there's also a lot of protection for guys like Trent Alexander-Arnold because as much as he got all the assists, you know, his defensive in capabilities, even last week, they, are, they have always been seen. So they, they do hide some of these things about these players and they are projected to be all, you know, even Wilshire. But when it comes to the tail end of their career, they're not hitting the heights. You know, for example, someone who may have been glorified but was not, let's look at the guys like uh, Trippier and Walker, who at the time were playing for a, a small club, Tottenham, and they never got all this attention. But look at them at the end of their careers. They're the best players in their clubs, you know. But these young ones who started in big clubs, you start at United, you start at Arsenal, you start at Chelsea, you get all this glorification, but you never hit the heights. You look at uh, Ruben Loftus-Cheek mm. for Chelsea at 2018, look at where he is now. Mm. Uh, guys like Hudson Odoi, he even couldn't even play for England. He's, he's really dwindled down. So I think for the big six, it's always going to be tough for a young player, but the media expectations have to be managed. Yeah. So it's the media hype probably that yeah, also media. counts to their eventual downfall media and fan hype i think they have to be always in control because even we look at guys right now someone like uh for uh i'm a united fan so someone like garnacho i think we should still wait up on him because he's still his age is still not that experienced to play in the big games to showcase what he has in the big games. so you know manage your expectations know that not every game from him will be a ronaldo-like performance or something Maurice, yeah. what has been your standout transfer so far? Even as European leagues kick off and, you know, Saudi Arabian league uh, has intensified, you know, their pursuit of being in public domain and, you know, giving competition to the well-oiled, you know, uh. Uh, European leagues like Premier League, La Liga, Bundesliga, because of, you know, acquisition of top-notch and world-class <laughs> players. The same thing that, you know, uh, MLS yeah. tried with Beckham and mm. it didn't materialize. Do you think uh, Saudi Arabian League would do something contradictory this time round? Mm. Maybe a standard transfer in terms of money, of course, they will go to Neymar and Co. going to Saudi Arabia. But in terms of quality football, Arsenal. I mean, from where I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Will they play 4-3-3? Or 4231, you know. I think personally, Declan Rice cannot uh, 
hold the midfield mm -hmm. alone. So, 4 2 3 1, maybe Declan Rice will uh, have a very good game, him alongside Party. Then uh, Odegaard just uh, a little bit in front, of course, Martinelli and Bukayo Saka, and then uh, Nketiah. Mm -hmm. uh, a big warning to the boy from Chelsea if he doesn't up his game, he will warm the bench. That's uh, so. Yeah, mm. you, you uh, look at how Trossard is playing, and he can't get into that team. And look at how he's fiery. But from a footballist perspective, I I, I want to see uh, Michael Zateta's mind. Is it four two three one? Is it four three three? But I think Thomas Partey uh, is still very crucial to Arsenal. Uh, let me say, winning the league. Uh, last weekend, he played an inverted V. The role where Zichenko always plays. But against uh, experienced good teams, you cannot play in that position. So that is the standout transfer for me in terms of footballing terms. Ken, from mm. where you sit, uh, do you agree with those pushing this narrative that, you know, in the event Saudi Arabian League comes to our TV stations, you know, mm. Premier League's popularity would come down? I think, I think that's, that's impossible because people, you are all the way in Kenya, all the way in India, but you identify with Man United as if you you walk into the stadium every day. I think some of these clubs have been supported for years. They, they have this culture and heritage that they cannot just lose fans to a league that is signing superstars. And also, you know, there will, there will be a bit of loss in terms of fans, but in terms of watching excitement and, and eagerness to even watch or visit the stadiums, visit the country, I think the Premier League takes it all because La Liga has always had Messi and Ronaldo for how many years, Benzema, but they have never quite broken down the dominance in terms of uh, TV uh, viewership and even money that the Premier League has. So I don't think Saudi Arabia would, would, would take that because I, I also believe the end goal for Saudi Arabia is to build their own football. So when it gets to 2030 after the World Cup, I would like to see whether they still maintain this signing strategy because all these players that they are signing, they are, they are getting this clause that they have to promote Saudi Arabia. They have to promote the bid for Saudi Arabia 2030 World, uh, 20, 2032 World Cup. You know, they, they have all these things that they have to do for that. And uh, when it gets to 2030, most of these guys they have signed right now, the big stars, the Neymars, Ronaldos, they would have retired. So I'd like to see the, uh, the angle that they take as that time the World Cup draws near. The departure of uh, Neymar from French money backs Paris Saint Germain mm -hmm. is it a huge setback to the team in their pursuit of winning their first ever Champions League title? Yeah, I think Neymar when he's fit is a very good player for PSG. He's been there for six years though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing for coming. I think the problem with PSG has always been the midfield, not necessarily the attack. Uh, even when they brought in, they had Messi, Neymar, Mbappe leading the attack. But the midfield, if it isn't Verratti, other guys are not quite up to the level of mm -hmm. Champions League squad depth. Mm -hmm. So the problem with PSG has always been the midfield, not necessarily the attack. So PSG will miss him. I don't know how they'll replace Neymar and uh, Messi, both exiting. And then we have Mbappe, who is not quite sure whether he wants to still remain at PSG. You know, it's going hot and cold and very inconsistent. Yeah, it's very inconsistent. But I think uh, they've talked now. And Mbappe seems like he'll be staying, but his heart is in Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he needs to be left to leave, Ken? I think for, 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 for next season they can, because if they let him leave now, you know, that's a window that a club that is going for the Champions League has lost Messi. Neymar and Mbappe. If they let him live right now, they're messing up their chances of winning the, the Champions League this season. If they had him. But then again, you look at the desire and you look at the football angle of it. Imagine Mbappe at Real Madrid. I think that fits well into many people's plans. Uh, but him staying, you know, he has to do what I think he has done really well for a couple of years, which is to carry the team because he's been their top scorer ever since they bought him. He has been a key player for the national side. So he just has to keep doing that, but with a weekend front line. And also, as, as uh, Maurice has said, the midfield is still in disarray because you look at the players they have right now. They've signed Usman Dembele, who will probably get injured. They have Kang Ying Lee, who is still a young player trying to find his feet. And they've signed Marco Asensio, who 
has not shown what he can do really at Real Madrid the past couple of years. So, you know, it's down to Mbappe to, to really push that team. And uh, I think uh, for the League One, it's always easy for PSG to win it. They have quality. They still have guys like Impembe playing there. They have a really good goalkeeper in Donnarumma. But for the Champions League, you've lost Neymar, you've lost Messi. You, you, you have to sign players of that ilk to replace at least one of them, you know. And I don't think Dembele is, is there because four games in, hospital bed. And that's so nowadays, Maurice individual brilliant doesn't count. Ah, it's about him. Particularly in the Champions League, yes. Mm. Uh, individual brilliance can win you a few games here and there, but teamwork is really, really key. Mm. Uh, to win. You remember even Pep uh, Guardiola, look at the game he played against Inter Milan in the final. They were second best. But uh, that cohesiveness, knowing when to attack, knowing when to sit back, uh, mm. taking chances uh, in your transitions and uh, you know absorbing the pressure when you are on the downside. So it calls for teamwork. Everyone doing his defensive uh, duties all the way from number nine, Haaland tracking back even when he's not getting the ball. So Champions League, it's about teamwork. Individual brilliance, yes, of course, can play a little bit role, but more it's more of the teamwork. And I think PSG uh, still do not yet have that. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's go into you know, the fixtures for the weekend. I think the tail end of today, we'll see two Premier League clashes that a lot of people are keeping an eye on. Newcastle mm -hmm. against Manchester City and Tottenham against Spurs. United fans saying that, you know, Tottenham without Harry Kane is, is, is toothless. Yeah, I, do, I don't think they're really toothless because you have to remember that this, they made a really good signing, which I think was, which has gone under the radar with this, which is James Madison. I think he's a really good number 10. He knows is how Richardson to play. Uh, scaring up front? No, Richardson, I don't think, for Spurs, I think he's only had one Premier League goal or something. I don't think he's been that prolific. Yeah to mm. be a threat to the, the, the quality that mm. United have has up front. He's not that prolific, sorry, in defence. I don't think he'll be a challenge for Varane and Martinez if he's fit, or even Lindelof. But I think the trouble will really come from their midfield, because Bisuma seems to have a starting role here, and uh, also Madison. And with Son as captain, I, I think he'll take, take the mantle and do what Ken has done. And also United were really poor against Wolves. Tottenham can use that because their midfield was all over the place. Uh, Mateus uh, Nunes and Kuhn had really ran rampant in that midfield. And if Tottenham watch that game, they will be looking to do the exact same thing because how Ten Hag has planned his midfield over the past four games, uh, starting with preseason, I think it has been really messy and it's something that I don't think is going to change in this game. And for Newcastle versus City, I think that's a game many wanted to see very early on so that we can really gauge whether New Newcastle are of that level or whether City are still City. So I think that will be a crunch tie, but I still think City will edge them a little bit. I like how these guys avoiding to mention Harry Maguire in, you know, <laughs> people at the defense of United who are pushing for He's going the situation of those who are under Eric Ten Hag. Considering his move to West Ham stalled. Yeah. yeah, but he's gone down the picking order. He's no longer first choice. So maybe he's not in the picture much. I think Manu made it clear, get another club. I think he should have gone to West Ham and maybe produce the goodies there and tell the guys I'm still good at what I do. But I'm looking at Chelsea. I'll give them time. They've lost Nkunku and Nkunku had a very good preseason. Mm -hmm. But I think if Nkunku comes back and with Caicedo in the whole you know uh, they have a good they have a good team but for me Arsenal uh, are still contenders in this one if, if you give me my top four predictions I think uh, Man City will be there Newcastle will be there Arsenal will be there I think Manchester Chelsea and Liverpool are going to struggle to get into that, in that order, that order. I, they, they're, they're going to struggle to look for that top four but I think Arsenal and Man City and Newcastle are a sure bet for top three. Yeah. Newcastle, at some point, they were thought to be, you know, the new Manchester City or Paris Saint-Germain because, you know, when there was ownership takeover, we thought they would go for marquee signings, something mm -hmm. that hasn't been forthcoming. But with the above-average players they have had, you know, 
They have yeah. defined all qualified for Champions League football, finishing top four last season, yeah. and looking forward to uh, another blistering season. Yeah, you, 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 they've done all that with guys like you know Callum Wilson up front, Joe Linton, Willock. So what if they actually went for the marquee signings? You know, they they finish people in the league, but but I also think again. Uh, for them playing in the Champions League this season for the first time, mm. I think that that may you know pull them back a bit because it's never easy. The traveling, different teams, how to break them down. You play a team twice. You have to go to this, this you know s small sides in Switzerland like young boys who they are really tough to beat at home. Guys like Malmo, you know, and then you play big guys like Bayern Munich. So the balancing may get tough the squad and at the same time let's say over the weekend you're playing a big game i think that will be tough for them but you know you can't rule them out i feel like they should have signed more they should have signed more because they've only added tonali and uh harvey Barnes to the squad who are really good signings but uh, i don't think they are if you're going to do something in the champions league i don't think you only need two guys like that yes they do have trip here but trip is is also not in terms of Champions and League, he's a defender. yeah, and he's a defender. And what if he gets hurt because they're going to play a lot of games again this season? You know, it will, it will be tough for them. But uh, looking at the league, how they've been performing, I think they can still have something uh, to, to to show at the end of the league again this season. But it is going to tough to be tough because. I'd look at Newcastle and Brighton as teams who are close to each other. It's just that Brighton did not have the same success last season. But in terms of ball playing, in terms of improvement, I think Brighton have it. Them losing Caicedo will not be an issue for them again because you watch the first game where they had no Caicedo and they, they, they absolutely blew their opponents apart. You know. So as Boris said, I tend to disagree a bit. I feel like the ones battling for top four, I feel like Newcastle, for that fourth place, Newcastle and Liverpool will be struggling for it. But I feel like United and Chelsea may be in the top four or top three this season, simply because to some key improvements they've made for Chelsea, especially <coughs> the coaching and uh, in the midfield. <coughs> I think that will really, really help them, uh, help their chances of getting in the Champions League. Well, which specific game are you keeping an eye on as far as European League fixtures are concerned? Because I understand it's only Premier League that is happening in La Liga. French League One, you know, Syria, Syria mm -hmm. and even Bundesliga. And I've got a friend of mine who is in Munich. He was mm -hmm. telling me that I think we tend to over glorify Premier League, forgetting other leagues which are equally beautiful. Uh, of, uh, no, one thing with Europeans, they love the leagues. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't go to a German and tell him, you know, about the league, league, Premier League, Premier League. Or, or you won't go to a Spaniard and tell him, you know, the French League is better. They love their leagues, they're that patriotic. But uh, look at the last uh, couple of years, English teams have always done well in the Champions League. That one tells you the quality of the league is high. So I'm looking forward to Manchester City in Newcastle, particularly. That will be a big um, crunch fixture. Yeah, that is what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I want to see how does Manchester City cope without uh, KDB, particularly. And if I'm called Palmer, I'm staying. Uh, you know, there, there are reasons for him to exit. I think he'll get more game time now that Riyad Mahrez and uh, KDB is out injured. I think Cole Palmer, test yourself. You're an academy youth product. Test yourself. Inspire generation. See what you can do. This is your chance. Against Arsenal in Premier League, uh, Cartel Reza, this cup is called Community Shield. Yes. I think KDB, when he got introduced alongside Phil Ford, we mm. happened to witness goals. Mm. Mm. It was an upsurge in play, but you know they won't have him for a while now. So I'm really, really keen to see on how they play, especially against this Newcastle side, which will try to outnumber you in the midfield area. Mm. You know, I'm keen to see how they, how well they do. But for me, uh, the standout match will have to be United versus Tottenham because these are two teams who are looking to go on better. They have had many changes over the season and it's not going to be an easy game because both of them did not start the season well. Both of them are still yet to show their quality. So against each other, it's the time. Whoever wins I this on one, Mount. I think, <laughs> I think <laughs> for guys like Mount, this is the game that counts for them because they, there's already hope lost amongst some of the fan base, 
some of the people watching football do not believe in this ability to to be able in, to play in that midfield. So it's it, that one will also be a really really significant game. And talking about United, you know, lady followers of the team are threatening not to support United if they reinstate the services of Mason Greenwood over you know red claims. And I think he got exonerated, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Morris, do their arguments hold water in their pursuit of ensuring that you know Mason Greenwood stays uh, out of United? Uh, why? I think uh, such matters are left to the courts, and if the courts say he did no wrong, yes, then we stick to the football aspect. Before those allegations came in, he was a brilliant footballer, a young prospect, a good lad. So give him a chance. Mm -hmm. Give him a, a chance. chance. Leave the courts. <laughs> For the courts, leave football for football. That's mm. what I'll say. I, I think for, for those supporters, I think what hurts the ladies more is that for Greenwood, the evidence was there for the public. <laughs> and, and that is what they'll be banking <laughs> on. Because as much as he came out of the court, there are still you know recordings and all these things. And that will be a tough one. But in the statement United released, they have put the onus on Richard Arnold to make that decision. I've been seeing that he's being added back to the ES Sports games, he's been added back to the website. Maybe they are slowly integrating, reintegrating him back into the squad. But until uh, Richard Arnold announces, I think uh, United fans should wait because whether people like it or not, there's going to be a storm over Greenwood coming back to the side. A nice conversation. It has been this particular Saturday afternoon, one to three touchline being the program. Ken Andrew and Morris Jr. traveling all the way. From Migori, he did, he did a top notch football commentary last weekend on Saturday with KBC Channel One alongside Isaac Lemoka during Kenya Secondary Sports School Association Bowl Games Football Finals, pitching St. Joseph Boys from Kitala alongside against Dagoretta High School, a game that ended 2 0 in favor of the boys from Transoia. And uh, you know, he's gracing our show this particular afternoon, his debut, and it looks like you know, we're going to be having him. More often as times go by. Morris, it's been a pleasure having you. Yeah, thanks for having me. How do you feel being part of the crew this particular afternoon? Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, we thank God. We thank uh, all the guys behind me, uh, my parents, uh, my fellow educators, and everyone was encouraging me in this journey. And hopefully, we come back to commentate the real games in the biggest sports channel. Definitely looking forward to that. Alongside Ken Andrew, a.k.a. the governor, you know, our residential panelist and a man who keeps gracing this particular show uh, on Saturday afternoon. It's been a pleasure doing this and, you know, we catch up again next Saturday, same time, same place. It's been an honor to our crew. Thank you for the fantastic job and let's keep doing it. Keep it touchline and keep it touchline Y255 and enjoy the rest of our programming even as our uh, next show gets set up. It's called The Buzz or something. And, you know, enjoy the rest of our programming. Don't go away. Stay tuned. It's the touchline.